Chapter 21 Namho rounded headland and saw, to her relief, that the shore did extend west. She paddled vigorously, looking for signs of people in the early morning light. She sniffed the air for cook fires. A troop of baboons trotted along the bank to observe her, and the males uttered threatening cries. Springbok, Duker, and Waterbuck hid in the shadows of M Masasas. Shoko and vervet monkeys leaped from tree to tree. But there were no people. Namho went ashore at midday. She built a fire and boiled mealy meal with the remains of the tomatoes. She wasn't discouraged. She only, she had only to keep going, and eventually the huts, fields, and brilliant lights of Zimbabwe would appear. Namho filled one of the pots with live coals and perched it in a pool with, of water at the bottom of the boat. There was no use wasting matches until she knew how far she had to go. After four days, she came to the end of, of the land. Namho was horrified. What had happened to the shore? Beyond lay nothing but featureless water. She directed the boat around a peninsula and began to paddle east. She, she searched the, dis, the distance anxiously for the shadow that would surely connect the trees, the rocks, and the abundant animal life to the north shore but it never appeared. At least the current's with me, she murmured, as the, boat, as the boat slid along. She camped again and hunted for food rather than depend on her, on, store, on her stores. As long as she kept busy, she didn't have to think about the, the significance for her new direction. Finally, after threading her way through a cluster of rocks surrounded by foam, she came again to an endless stretch of water. With a pounding heart, she turned south. When she spotted a small island at the end of, the, of a headland, she couldn't avoid the truth any longer. There was the place she had taken a bath. There was the branch she had tied up to. The low-hanging tree was unmistakable. And yes, she even saw some crocodile watching her with yellow slitted eyes. It's another island, wailed Namho. Lake Kabora Basa was so huge, it couldn't contain a place this large and still give no hint of where the shore might be. I hate you, she screamed at the big island. What are you doing out here? Why aren't you in Zimbabwe, where you belong? Snap! The, bolt, the boat jolted in a sickening way. Namho had been paddling rapidly, not paying attention. The boat had driven right onto a sharp edge, spur of rock just under the water. Namho wrestled it free, but began to but began to seep in at an alarming rate. One of Crocodile Guts's old cracks had opened up. She had no time to waste, so she drove the craft toward the low hanging tree. The crocodile fled into the lake as she approached. Namho dragged the boat out of out of danger and sat down to her to catch her breath. I shouldn't have insulted the big island, she moaned. Aunt Chippo had often scolded her for speaking out, for speaking without thinking first. It was always dangerous to say bad things about an unknown place. Who knew what spirits were listening? Well, I've really gotten in myself into a mess this time, she told Mother. I've wrecked the boat. I'm nowhere near Zimbabwe, and my only neighbor is a big, hungry crocodile. Namho soon discovered she had more than one neighbor, however. As she unpacked the boat, she saw a fur furtive uh, mo mo movement in the bushes. She grabbed the panga and watched the shadows with her heart pounding. After a few moments, the bushes moved again. A shrill barked bark made Namho jump back with a knife raised over her head. This was followed by a soft cheering as though someone um, we're, t we're talking to himself. Go away, shouted Namho. The creature uttered four or five staccato cries and retreated. It was a baboon. Namho realized at once she had a serious problem. Baboons could destroy her entire food store in a matter of minutes. Normally she um, could have floated the supplies in the boat. But the crack made this impossible. Why didn't I see them last time I was on the island? 
she wondered. They must have been watching her from the trees. It was still morning, so she kindled a fire from the pot of coals and roasted yams while she thought. Baboons hated to cross water, she knew. They avoided it for some reason. People did. Crocodiles lurked under the surface. Namho considered the line of rocks between her and the large island. It would be just barely possible to keep from to leap from stone to stone. If you were a baboon, a person couldn't do it. But why go to the trouble? The little island was too small to feed a troop. Namho ate the yams with an uncomfortable feeling that she was being observed. She turned quickly. The bushes moved as though something had recoil recoiled, and she hurled a rock at it. She moodily watched the flames die down. A termite mound rose not far from where she was sitting. I could fill the crack with, with clay, Namho suggested. It's worth a try, said Mother. Of course, it would be better if I baked the boat like a pot. Don't you burn my mukua wood, Crocodile Guts cried. He stood in front of the craft to protect it. Namho chipped off a por portion of the termite nest with Uncle Kufa's knife. While watching carefully from the mambas that inhabited such places, she crushed the clay between two rocks and made a thick paste with water to smear over the outside of the boat. She would have to wait for the seal to dry. Go away, she screamed hurling a stone at a baboon. He had almost reached the food stores. She rained missiles at him as he scrampled, scampered clumsily into a tree. He clambered to the top branches and hooted at her with a grimace of fear. I don't like you either, yelled Namho. She noticed that the baboon's tail ended in a lumpy scab. Something had recently chopped it into. His, his left hind paw was twisted to one side like Tazviona's foot. It looked like a birth defect, not an injury, so it could have been caused by a witch. Did baboons even have witches? The, long, the longer Namho studied the miserable creature, the more certain she was that he was the only member of his troop on the island. He was too nervous to have companions. By now, she... she by now, sorry you guys, by now she should have heard the barks of other animals. He must have been chased by something extremely frightening to make him cross the water. She wondered what it was. Now he was trapped. Unless he worked up the courage to return, he would starve. It's not my problem, Namho said, turning her back. She applied another coating of termite mud turned the boat over and winced when she saw the damage caused by the spur of rock. Outside, the crack was tiny, but further in it grew as wide as her little finger. She forced clay into the opening. One baboon wasn't a serious problem, especially such a timid one. He wouldn't forage at night. The crocodile might be out after dark, but it wouldn't be interested in her, in her food stores. Although I'm sure it would be delighted with me, Namho said bitterly. She built a half, a large half circle of fire in front of a rocky bluff. The crocodile wouldn't attempt to, to crawl over hot coals. The, the baboon would spend the night cowering in a tree. Feeling reasonably safe, Namho settled down inside the half circle of fire with her on the shrinking mealy bag. She stared up at the stars as though the, the thought of a, of a story to tell mother whose jar rested at the base of the cliff with the rest of Namho's belongings. Once upon a time, there was a man with two wives. The senior wife, whose totem was the baboon, gave birth to many daughters. But the junior wife, whose totem was the zebra, gave birth to many sons. Because of this, everyone treated the junior wife with great kindness and respect. The senior wife was so unhappy, she became thin as a rat. In our family, Namho remarked to mother, grandmother had only daughters, and no one complained about it. At the thought of Ambuya, Namho felt such a wave of loneliness, sickness sweep over her. She had to swallow hard several times to keep from crying out loud. One day, Namho said, 
when she had recovered, a hen belonging to the junior wife wandered into the senior wife's hut and broke three pots. Ooh, see what your animal has done, the older woman cried. An ordinary chicken wouldn't hunt out my things to break them. A witch must have trained it. What kind of family do you come from, retorted the younger woman. Your father begged on the on the roads, and your mother, Ruro, was a basket of stale millet. My Ruro was a, her a herd of fine cows. Be quiet. You bring shame upon all of us with, with fighting. The wives were scolded by the oldest woman in the village. Two wives went into their huts to sulk. But the next day, the older woman sang a loud song as she ground mealies into flour. Why am I plagued with someone whose mother is a witch who scoops up water with the tail of a hyena? Ay, ay. Her ears are round as dinner plates and her skin feels like the dark, like the bark of a tree. The junior wife heard the words as she was meant to do and became very angry. The next day she, she ground Millie Mill and made up a song. Ah, ah. The women in this area have no brains. Their lips hang open like cooking pots. Their hair is grass left over from the dry season. Their skin feels like burned logs, and their nostrils yawn like warthog burrows. Every day, one or, or the other wives would make up an insulting song. Everyone in the village was secretly amused by the battle, and only the husband was unaware of what was happening. Finally, the junior wife became so angry, she crept into the senior wife's hut and dropped a chunk of baboon meat. The, the older wife's totem into her cooking pot. That night at dinner, the senior wife suddenly began to grow hair. She sprouted a tail, and her nose stretched long. Barking like a baboon, she ran off into the forest. Everyone was horrified. They suspected what had happened, but no one had any proof. The daughters of the senior wife went into the fields to work the next day. They took the youngest girl, who was only a baby with them, she cried loudly for food, and at once a female baboon burst out of the forest and snatched her up. Her breastfed baby laid it on the ground. Sorry, she breastfed the baby and laid it on the ground and ran away. After that, the daughters took the baby to the baboon mother every day. Still, they were afraid the creature might run away with the child. So they told their father what had happened. He went to the Nangana for help. The Nangana put poison on bananas and left them where the baboon mother could find them. She vom vomiting up the chunk of baboon meat and turned back into a human at once. Now everyone learned about the nasty trick the junior wife had played. The husband sent her back to her parents and gave her jewelry to the senior wife. I'm sorry, the husband sent, back, sent her back to her parents and gave all of her jewelry to the senior wife. Namho added wood to the ring fire. In spite of the precautions she had taken, she was too nervous to sleep. Her father's totem, and therefore her hers, was Shumba, the lion, or so grandmother believed. That's what he told me, anyhow, she said. In my opinion, it should have been the hyena. Don't look like that, little pumpkin. I'm sure you aren't related to hyenas. Namho's clan name was Gurunduro which grandmother explained meant the people who wear the Nundoro. The Nundoro were round discs worn by kings. Namho rather hoped this meant she came from a royal family, but grandmother said old kings had dozens of wives, so of course they had a multi multitude of children. Some of the descendants were fine people, but some inevitably, in inevitably turned out to be lazy parasites. Like your father, grandmother added. Because Namho, Namho's totem was the lion, she wasn't permitted to eat one. As if I would try, she said, smiling at mother's jar. People who ate their totems lost their teeth or went blind or, or became sterile or occasionally turned into, forbidden, into the forbidden animal. It was extremely easy to avoid eating lions, so Namho never worried about it. Grandmother's totem was Moyu, the heart which meant that she wasn't allowed to eat the heart of any creature. Aunt Chipo, Aunt Shuvai, and Mother had been Shiri, 
the bird, which would have um, been an enormous problem if it had meant any bird. Fortunately, the ban applied only to the fish eagle who carried Maury's message. Uncle Kufa and therefore his children weren't allowed to eat the gumbo or the leg of the cow. They could eat any other part of the animal, though. Since cattle were almost never killed, the difficulty rarely came up. Namho listed the totem, Mutupo, and clan name, Chitayo, of everyone in the village. It was important to remember this information, so she wouldn't marry a relative by accident. Tazviano's Mutuputo, let me see, let me see, is... Namho stopped in consternation. Tazviano's totem was the baboon. If Tazviano's ate a piece of baboon meat, she would turn into the animal. And because she had a twisted foot, Namho sat up and scanned the dark trees at the top of the cliff. Don't be foolish. It's only a stupid animal, she thought. But she couldn't ever remember seeing a baboon that deformed. It wouldn't have survived. It's not my problem, Namho decided decided firmly, putting the idea out of her head. She lay back down and presently and presently drifted off into into the first of many fitful periods of sleep. And I'll read chapter twenty two very soon.